So I acknowledge the traditional owners and, um, um, and their elders past and present. Um, people, I, I just want to simply say that um, since the days of the Aboriginal Embassy, when we put it up in 1972, um, one of the brothers from down here, Bertie Williams, um, who was with us, he took the name of, yeah, I think I understand now, he called himself um, another name, what was it, um, <laughs> Kevin Johnson. And I later learned that Kevin Johnson was his cousin's name. And, um, and I said to uh, Bertie, when he took that name, I said, Bertie, what do you do that for? He said, well, he said, I'm supposed to be reporting to police in Melbourne. I said, that's a bit silly because your, your face is going to be on the first page of the newspaper tomorrow. I said, they're going to know exactly who you are and where you are. I said, you're taking, your, taking this other name. I said, you, did you make up the name? He said, yeah, I just made it up. He didn't tell me it was his cousin. But, you know, like, um, when we put that embassy up, there, was, there were two things that we were focused on, right? One was land rights, and the second one was um, uh, sovereignty, um, sovereignty never ceded. Now, so we won land rights. We got everything we wanted from land rights. But then native title killed them. Native title killed them. Yeah. Totally killed them. Yeah. Now, but we can win this back. And I'll show you how we can do that. They're signing all these things, I'll put this over here. In your they got people signing these things. I'll tell you what they are later on. But then, one of the things that I said to Paul Coe and everybody and Gary Foley was about the sovereignty. So they didn't want it to do it. They really didn't want it to do it because it was too hard. And mind you, I set it aside too for 20 years myself and just said, well, okay, let's look at how this happens. So I went back and became a lawyer. And, um, once I became a lawyer and then I did all the sorts of things and then I started looking into this here at a closer, um, very close up version of what this is. Now, sovereignty, if we draw a circle and make it very easy like this, there's sovereignty. You're only bound by the limits of your own law that you come from in terms of making rules and regulations that govern you as an individual. So let me take another example. We have this lady here, free young woman. Yeah? She's exercising sovereignty over herself. She makes all her decisions within the elements of what's around her. But in terms of her personal life and her personal world, right, she makes the decision for herself. Yeah? And she stays within the bounds of what? she decides to do. She can break the law and say, I want to go outside of that law, I don't agree with that law. You know, and then she's limited by whatever comes back on her, but she has responsibility for that. So her total responsibility is the decisions that she makes for herself. Now, the way she gives away her sovereignty, the 
personal sovereignty, is she decides that she's going to marry someone. So as soon as she finds, de decides to marry someone, now she's got to sh share all her decision making and her relationship with that person she marries. And so now she's talking about herself and her partner. So the decision she makes, she has to make and consider for herself and her partner. And so they make decisions for each other. And all that goes out of whack when they don't want to make decisions for each other and don't share those decisions. And so the relationship is, is separate from each other. And so then you have war. Okay? And that's the same as other people. Now, when she has children, then she has to extend her sovereignty. Because now she's making decisions for her children, she has to make decisions to work for their welfare and their, and their care and keep. And so within that family unit, there's a core family unit. And that's the parents, so they make those decisions. And so they stay within their realm. And their relationship then outside of that is what they decide on how they join that, that outside world. And so that's a contract that you enter into, it's a social contract to work in that system. And you're outside of your own personal world, but you develop a social contract to participate in that other world, in other people's world, uh, on your terms, under their conditions. And so you have this agreement. You either agree with it or you don't. Here, under sovereignty, it's the same thing. We get all these, all these tribes, and if you, most of us, where I come from, we have four clans. And we have our undefined territories. We know our boundaries. This mob here can't make decisions for that mob, and vice versa. Right? We make our own. When we're in ceremony, we one mob. Because we teach them, we have obligations to each other. Okay? And so the sovereign powers that we have within this unit here is dependent on what we're, what we're prepared to give each other and how we relate to each other and they, how we want to exercise that power. Now, when we talk about this here seated, along come England, <coughs> over here, and England then, they come in here, except that they put a big ring over us. And they took over. And when we got in the road, they just killed us. Done. And they broke, they broke down this whole system. And when you look at the history, and this is what we're doing with that um, Anzac parade thing that we're doing, recognising the front of your walls, and there he is, the man who led the first one. Right? Um, when, <coughs> when we did that, we did that to make a statement. Because we said there was bloodshed on this little soil here by us and our ancestors protecting our interests in this country. We never gave it up. Never gave it up at all and we fought all the time. But these fellas, the British put that big circle over top and they just sat right on top of us. And we didn't have a mechanism, we didn't know their system, we didn't know how to defend them, because we've never been at war with people like, like they have been in Europe all these all those years, you know? You know, they're, they're a mongrel breed of people because they, yeah, they come from everywhere, you know? And they, they raped and pillaged and took each other's land and did all sorts of things over there. So they were used to that culture. We were not used to that culture. And this is where today our passiveness, you know, and the fact that we are not a warlike people. We've never been a warlike people. You come into our country, though, and you start mucking up in there, we'll tell you what, how, how dangerous we can be. Yeah, that's for sure. But you go outside of that, we can't fight for other people's country because we haven't got the right. And that's the nature of our culture. We can't go outside unless the mother mob invite us to go and fight with them for their country. And that's why a lot of us stay away from each other and we don't get engaged with each other. And believe it or not, the Australian governments, since the 1830s, when they did all that anthropological work, when they did all this their, um, ethnology work with all them white fellows, these white fellows were writing about us, learning about our culture, and they were advising government were watching very closely, the British were watching very closely. And they understood that us Aboriginal people would never come together to fight as one unit against the oppressor. And they knew that because our law and culture forbids us from coming into someone else and telling them, you fight that fellow. I got one story from my mob at, at a place called Angledoo in northern New South Wales, Angledoo here. 
and then the bow and river come down like that, and then the place where Walton is. This more beer, one more beer, were fighting with white fellas all through here during the 1830s, 1840s. And they kept white fellas all the way back. They teamed with a big mob of black fellas because they all did ceremony with each other. They married into each other and they fought. And it talks about, and there are books written about it, the 14 year war. We kept the white fellas back past Gunder Winter, going back towards Brisbane. And then there's, there's one very famous um, message thing that sits in the Museum of Sydney. And they got one old man who could read it from Moree. They found it down here at a place called Terry Oil, in an Aboriginal mission. And that message stick was saying, when the old man read it, he said, them old fellas saying, we lost a lot of people dead, and we need more. So they were sending for reinforcements to come up and man this here. Now, here at Walgett, my mob here at Anglo, my mother's mob, they heard these Walgett fellas let white fellas across the river <coughs> down here. This mob here went down to Walgett and they went after them black fellas and had a big fight with them because they let white fellas across the river. We didn't want them white people across the river. And there's, and there's two old black fellas there now, we got, they're buried side by side. Them two old ringing, we call them clever fellas or Kilpy or lawmen, senior lawmen. In order to stop each other from killing each other, us black fellas killing each other, these two old men said, me and you fight that. Eh? And whoever win, you're right. But in that war, they killed each other. In that fight, they killed each other. They both died uh, from the wound. And they both buried together. That was, 18, that was 1860. And, that and we had them two buried together, side by side. And we tell that story to all the kids down there. Now, so this here mob here, when we talk about this, this resistance, that's why the frontier war is very important. Because we need to show that we didn't lay down. Now that's, that's important because it shows that we never relinquished, we never gave up it. Now, all these white fellas in Australia, they've done all their research and they know how weak they are. Believe it or not, they know that they do not have legal grounds to stay on this country. If you look at a paper, there's a book, and um, I think we, you should get it, Lydia. Um, it, it's, a, it's a publication called 200 Years Later. It's a report to the Parliament in 1984 on, um, on the ability of the Commonwealth Government to negotiate a treaty with Aboriginal people at the Commonwealth level. Because I was the Treaty Research Director for the National Aboriginal Conference. And what the government did was that they appointed a committee on constitutional legal affairs from the parliament, so it was a parliamentary committee, to look at how to negotiate a treaty with Aboriginal people in this country. Now, there's, I think the, the, the most telling statement that comes out of that, I think it's here somewhere early, is it? Can you please find it? Um, the most telling statement from that is what they call an admission against interest by the Australian government. And this is where we, as Aboriginal people, need to know what this truly means because it shows you and our people how powerful we are. Yeah? We can drive a bulldozer right through this country. We just don't know how to turn it on and start the motor. And, the thing, and they're frightened of it. They are horrified that we will learn how to drive that out, drive it on. Hey? Yeah. Don't you worry, I'm I'm gonna be sitting wrong so I do whoever starts that motor. But this is what the Parliament this is now this has been submitted to the Parliament of Australia by this committee. And they said it was it, it was further stated, and this is from the report from the inquiry, that some would say that sovereignty in aid and Aboriginal people inhabiting Australia at the time of settlement by the European. <coughs> and that sovereignty still subsists. So we've got to understand the English words here. Yeah? That that sovereignty still subsists, even though not recognised by the occupying power or its legal system. So the Australian government, in their own report to their parliament, 
admit that they are an occupying power. Yeah? That's what they, they admit that. They have no legal sovereignty in this country. Australia can't pass laws in this country, in the parliament, that becomes legal in their own right. Them laws that they pass in parliament, the Senate and the House, even in the state parliament, the laws that they pass, when they pass them laws, it's just a piece of paper with a lot of words on it. Yeah? Setting out all the laws. But that parliament can't make it legal. That, that, that law is not legal until they give it to Queen Elizabeth's representative or the Governor or the Governor-General. When they give that to the Governor or the Governor-General, as soon as he puts his moniker on it, as soon as he puts his signature on it, that becomes law. So what does that mean for us? But it simply means this. Um, um, the soon as when, when we when we look at this, what does this mean for us? What that means here, and it shows you very clearly, is this: Australia does not have sovereignty of its own. The Australian government, the state government, they are not sovereign entities under their own right. They operate in right of the Crown of England. So the sovereignty that Australia operates under is the sovereignty of England, not of Australia. There's no Queen of Australia. There is a Queen of Australia, but for the, for the, for the, for the white people. The real Queen is gone. Yeah. No, let's, 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 just, let's just deal with how they're doing it now. Let's deal with it now. Yeah? And the fact is that Queen Elizabeth II, right, is a queen for every state in Australia mm. under their constitution, yep. and she's also the queen for the Commonwealth. So essentially, you have seven queens in Australia. <laughs> yeah, seven queens, right? She's the queen for Victoria, she's the queen for New South Wales, she's the queen for West Australia, and she's also the queen for the Commonwealth of Australia. Now, the Governor General cannot pass, cannot sign law in the state of Victoria. He can only sign laws for the Commonwealth Parliament. Victoria can't sign laws for anyone else other than their own state. So that governor represents the Queen, who has the power. And that's where we as Aboriginal people need to understand that that woman, in, that old woman in that big house over there at Fred Hooper Corner in London, she's the boss. She's the boss. Now, so you take her out of the equation, Australia falls apart. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have any legal authority to pass laws in this country un other than under her signature. So the lie that they keep telling us is the fact that Australia is an independent nation. Now, England, England only allowed them to pass laws for Australians and govern themselves as a colony, be self-governing. And so they, they pass the laws for us here. Because England don't know how we live here, so they pass their laws for them. But England gives them the right to do that. Without that right from England, they don't have any power or authority. And so we come back then to what they say here. You see, they say that Aboriginal people, some would say, Sovereignty and aid and Aboriginal, in Aboriginal people inhabiting Australia at the time of settlement. We know that. Of course we know that. We had sovereignty and it, it didn't... It, 1992, then we had Mabo. Now Mabo, number two. Mabo number two threw a real spanner in the works. Right? And the Australians and the white people in this country, lawyers and everybody, and foreign investors panicked. They panicked because the High Court of Australia recognised what they said here. 
Europeans and that sovereignty still subsists, that's with us, our sovereignty, still subsists even though not recognised by the occupying power or its legal system. As soon as Mabo come in, Mabo recognised our sovereignty. And a lot of people say, no, it didn't, and I say, yes, it did. What they said in Mabo is that we now, the common law of Australia now recognises that Aboriginal law and culture survived British sovereignty. Now, if that survived British sovereignty, they've admitted then that our law and culture was never ever taken away at all. And that's our law and culture. That's got nothing to do with it. And that's the law for this land in each of these communities, in each of these areas, like I say, each of them clans, each of them tribes, they still have sovereignty. White law, white law does not supersede Aboriginal law on your own land. i say that again. White law in this country cannot supersede Aboriginal law on your own country. So if you're on your own country and you're doing things on your country, don't care who's on it, and you operate under your law and culture, that white law can't deal with it, can't touch you. And this is what I've done in doing all this analysis. And the way in which we're doing it now is that I'm saying, we don't take them to court, we're going to make them take us to court. So I've got more mob at home there now, the young fellows. Every possession of Crown land that's in our country, I said, you want to put a fence around it? Put a building on it? Take over it, straight away. Right? We, they just bought property off some farmers out there. They get a big sign on the gate. Crown land trespassers will be prosecuted, yeah? Unauthorised persons will be prosecuted. Right. So I get on, sorry. The trees are on for that land itself in that yeah. country, right here, and you've been away from, like from the stolen generation. Yeah. And you was taken away from your country. And then finally, after so many years, you come back mm. and find out this is your country. Yeah. But people, all, like Aboriginal people, put a claim and they took mm. it to the high courts. And they got recognition and like they had 99 year lease mm. on, 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 that, on that country. So we can still go back in there and say, hang on, this is mm. our country and we can still prove it. Yeah. Because we can prove it. Yeah, but the thing is, and, and on top of that, um, what they actually did, it was a lease before, mm. but they actually claimed on the lease by taking it to the court. Yeah. And then they're saying that's their country, but the thing is, it's smack, smack in the middle of our property yeah. that we own, and they form a different different side altogether. Like they form yeah. territory side, mm. and we Western Australia side, and they actually put a claim on it. And they said now, because it, like, in, like in that section, we've got um, iron ore in that, mm. in that section, and they put a claim on it. Yeah. And they, now they're reaping all the benefits from it. Yeah. You know? And this is something that I, got, I, I wanted to change, is mm. to see um, how can I go about it. Yeah. You know? So well, do you have to go through the legal... Uh, yeah. I wrote an article in there, in, and I put it up, saying to, the pe saying to people, our people, stop thinking white, start trying to think black. Can I come back to the C1E? Yeah. Right. Um, th those old people in WA, you know, that big... big settlement they did in Perth, you know, and, and that southwest region there of Perth. Um, what was his name, that old man from... <laughs> I, no, 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 the old man, the older fellow. Um, the dad, I mean, he comes to the embassy so, a lot of times. The old fellow from Western Australia. Anyway, when they were signing that, the, them fellows were signing it, they had a group going down and saying, but well, we don't want to do with this, that, that agreement that uh, West Australian government put in over Perth and all the South East region. They said, we don't agree with this. We don't want to be part of it. And so he, is, he contacted me and, um, and, he, and he said, what can us old fellas do to stop this? I said, well, you're not going to stop it if other people want to, want to do it. Yeah. Because the majority are going to overrule you. And he said, well, we don't want to do with it. I said, well, you fellas map the country that you belong to inside that territory and say, that agreement don't apply to this mall because we don't agree with it. This is our country. You make decisions for your mall. So you fellows were at that meeting, you put your hand up for it, you fellows were at that meeting, you put your hand up for it, but your country's there. This is my country here. 
Yeah? And we don't agree with them. So what do they do? They won a court case two weeks ago in Perth. And that Iliwa, that Indigenous Land Use Agreement, and that agreement they entered into was thrown out the door by the court. Found to be illegal because one mob didn't agree with it. One mob didn't agree with it. Okay? Yep. And so this native title here requires everybody to agree yes. right, under their law. Yep. But now, this George Brandis, the Attorney General, is trying to change that now. Yeah. They've got a bill in the Parliament to change it so that majority rule, not everybody, majority rule. So two thirds can say yes, one third, yeah. under, yes. under white sort of law, you're out the door. But under this one here, the way they wrote it, they wanted every black fellow to sign it, right? Now, because the Maori people won that case, they stood their ground, the Wajak mob. They stood their ground, they won that case. They're now amending this year to say two thirds majority, or majority rules, yeah? Now, as soon as they change that, they've talked to me and I've, I've said to them, well, we can't do anything yet. We have to let the bill go run its course. We can do all the objections to it but we have to be let the bill run its course. The moment the Governor-General puts his signature on it to say that the change is illegal, that's when we challenge yeah. that law in the High Court. We can't change it until he puts his moniker on it. As soon as he signs it, we challenge it. And we challenge it on, this, on the grounds that here, all you white fellas, governments, and this is why I said it earlier, you've got all the ethnology studies that these white people have done over the years, Elkin and Stanner and all them fellas, Bert and all them fellas, they've been studying us and they know the way in which we make decisions about our country. All these white people know all this. They've been very well briefed on it. And so, they know under our law, these two, these three more people might agree, but they still can't talk for that country there because that's my country. That's my clan. Okay? And so, the moment they sign this, this new law into place to take away our right to say no, that's discrimination. And that violates Section 10 of the Racial Discrimination Act. Yeah? And so we will challenge the way in which they're doing that because, and there's another thing, they also break an Aboriginal law. Uh, uh, where did you let me finish this? So they, they break an Aboriginal law, right? And you see, in Marvo, the High Court said that the High Court, uh, sorry, Aboriginal law and culture is not a construct of the common law, but rather the common law is now, uh, sorry, Aboriginal law and custom is now recognised by the common law. Yeah? Now, that binds those courts to take into account our law and culture. It binds them. They can't get away from it. And so as soon as they break the law, our law, and do laws that go against that, they're going against something that's held in their own high court, and they're also violating the Racial Discrimination Act. So there's two points of argument that they will lose on. Yeah, they can't do it. And we as a people need to know how to stop that. And so now that we know what they're doing, we can stop this. So you folks, the are going to try what you can do is you say, okay, you mob might want to sign that there and do those things, but this is my mother's country here or my father's country, yeah? And I'll draw the boundary for you. Whatever you do, don't apply to that country. Don't apply to that country at all, and you stay away from that country, yeah? And you have the ability to be able to take them to court and sue them for any damages they do to your country. There's a thing in white man's law it's called T-O-R-T. And I mentioned this to a white lawyer here in Victoria yesterday at that meeting. I said, what do you know about tort? He said, I know about tort. I said, it's a common law thing. He said, yeah. I said, the Americans use it very well in their courts. I said, but you Australians are frightened to use it. And they're frightened to use it because, you see, if white Australians, lawyers, start using this here tort law, us blackfellas are going to get everything back. Mm -hmm. Now, what a tort is, is there he is, this fellow here, here, us mob here, we're making a decision, 
can we, what our decisions are going to hurt him, even though he's not involved in this. He, he say, no, I don't want to be a part of it yet. So our actions is going to affect him and his mob, and it's going to hurt him, and it'll have consequences on him. And we don't care, we're just totally ignoring his rights. So he can say, no, wait a minute. He can go into an Australian court and say, use his tort law and say, your decisions affected me and it hurt me this way. I want compensation for it. And you've got to compensate for the decisions you made because you hurt me, you destroyed that. And so what we need to do now is start using this. That, so what I've done in the New South Wales, which will hit New South Wales court, not this Friday, but the Friday after, I'm filing a case in New South Wales and I'm dating it all back to 1975 when the racial discrimination came into play, the Racial Discrimination Act in 1975. I've got all, I'm, we've got people now Google, doing Google Earth, looking at all the land in our country. And we're looking at how much land has been destroyed and cut down since 1975. We're looking at how they've impacted on that land. And so what I'm gonna do is go into the court and say to them, um, that's 1975, that's 1985, that's 1995, that's 2005, yeah? Look at the destruction that's happened to my country since 1975. Under my law and culture, you never asked me for permission at all. And you've interfered with my law and culture. You've interfered with my totems, you've interfered with the ecosystems, where all my animals are, You've interfered with the, with the bread basket that belonged to us, all our fruit and vegetables. You've knocked down medicine trees, you've knocked down spiritual trees, you've knocked down everything we use on our country. Yeah. Now, since Marba came into play, Marba took it right back to 1975. And so all the damage you've done now, I want you to pay me for all that damage. Yeah. And that's one of the remedies that I've put in the case. And I'm saying to them, I want compensation for every tree, every blade of grass, every shrub that you've knocked down. Now, when we do that, them white fellas, they haven't got enough money to pay for that. But the thing is, they have to. Now, the judges, and I know a lot of them, I know some of the judges in that high court. One bloke I went to university with, he's now a senior judge in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. One of the things that, that they're scared of is Aboriginal people taking this action. They, they, they're really panicking, judges. Because you see, the only people who can protect the politicians are the judges, the courts. They're the only ones who can protect them against us. So I'm doing this here because I'm now testing the parliament and saying to the parliament, you don't have the power to do this. I'm sorry. If you want to pass a law like that, you've got to talk to us. And then we'll give you permission to pass that law. Because when you impact on Aboriginal law and culture, you're breaking our law. And that Leo, as a result of Marvel, recognises our law and culture in common law. So when you break in our law, you're breaking your own law because it's now recognised in your common law system. And this is the way we got to start hammering home the home truths. And so, as the lady says here, we have to learn and have the now courage to go on and take back what we do. And with regards to the, those decisions that you're talking about, them up there, when you go to the next meeting, you say, all right, here's my mother's country, here's my father's country. We're part of that country tomorrow. You can do whatever you want with the rest of your country, but don't make that decision to affect this. That's all you have to say. And you say, we have lawyers who will now prosecute you for any damage done to our country. Because I'm saying to them, if you can't understand my law, well then you can't make judgment about it. Okay? You out of this here. That's out of your jurisdiction. And if you want some of my old fellow to advise you, well then you go and get them black fellas and sit them next to you up there on the bench up there, and let them advise you after they listen to the argument, and then them old fellas will tell you whether well, I'm right or wrong. Yeah. But until then, you as a white man, you've got no chance. And so you have to disqualify yourself from the bench when you're dealing with Aboriginal law. And so, that's my approach. And so what's happening now back home, yeah, it's taken a long while, yes. but he, I've, got an, I've got an 83 year old man yes. who sits in the car guiding everybody, 
Yeah. And he said, we can't do anything until that fella come meet. Right? We can't make any decision on that country until we talk to Michael. He was Michael the fella who's the boss for this country now. Yeah. And he said, I'm 83 year old. I got wisdoms of learning, but I didn't learn what he learned yes. from the old ones. Yes. Yeah? And so he's the boss man for this country. And so there are, there's a social division and we can understand how that works. Yes. So the community looks after community. But when it comes to all these other high level discussions up here, that, that's left to them other senior fellows and they're going to sit down and talk about it. Because yes. you see, here, in this year, I'm going to talk to them other law fellows for them. Right? And then I talk to them fellows. And then we look at, we look at the, how the decisions that are going to be made are going to affect everybody. Yeah? And so if that decision made here, gonna, this decision made there, going to affect this mob here, even though you're not participating in it, and you don't have representative, them senior lawmen who sit there, they will say, no, nah, we, can't, we can't talk for them fellas here, you know? We're going to find someone to talk for them, because we can't make law for them, we can't make decisions for them. And this is where here, down here, because we're not able to understand that legal system that within our traditional, our ancient laws, then <clears throat> it's not impossible to bring people who understand that legal system. And so that's why when Wal Saunders contacted me yeah. about his position, when Wal contacted me, he said, I, I need some advice, Uncle. I need to know how to, how to fight these fellows, yeah? And so when, when I talked to him, over there, I said, I want you to get A, B, C, and D because I know all that historical documents because I read it when I was in the university, yeah? <coughs> and it's all about the country tomorrow, people. That's right. Right? I said, now, so you, you more. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I said to him, I said, now you get all that paperwork mm -hmm. and you bring it to the court, I'll throw that in the court room. And say, you people, this court here knows all about that. All your law lawmakers know all about this and you know that you do not have the legal right to sit here in judgment of this man. Because, no if, if, they've had because the impact, the if they've had an impact on your capacity or ability to prove something, that's where that talk comes in, Michael. That's when you can start well, hitting them with the racial discrimination yeah. from what? Yeah. On damages. In our place, up here in Western Australia, in the, in, like in the Kimberleys, yeah. the thing is, with younger people, yeah. we've actually, we're there to learn about their law and culture and plus the dream time stories and everything to yeah. carry on for the future. You know, and we get taught at a young age to carry on that. And our elders back in Western Australia said, once they start teaching you about a lot of stuff, they pick you to be a leader, to take on, you know, the A steps. And the thing is, when they actually teach you, they teach you step by step of everything. Yeah. If you mess up, you do something wrong, then he's not a good teacher. So the rest of the older people yeah. will get stuck into him and then get stuck into the all the um, trainees, like, mm -hmm. like, like me for an example. You know, and the biggest thing about a lot of things, just getting back to Michael when he was talking about the land and stuff like that, I was, a, I was only just a young man at that time, during that time, my uncle, I, I didn't quite understand him when he got up and he started arguing with KLC. KLC, back in the 70s, was there with ALT, you know, Avenue Land Trust. And, land yeah, Kimberley Land Council, yep, and ALC. They actually came out to his block and tried to tell him what to do with his country. And he said, no, 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 no. So they gathered everybody else. And like how Michael was saying, mm. right, you're all, all different tribes, but you still get a leader, and that's the first generations, see? Yeah. The first generations take over, the second generations, that's your cousins. Your cousins can't step over the board, yeah. see? And the third generations can't yeah. step over. It yeah. follows the one, and it goes all the way down for that family until they all maybe deceased or something, yeah. and they pass on, then it'll pass on to the second generation. Yeah. That's how it works. But when it came at that time, when the ALC and the um, KLC came out, and they decided they wanted to um, for cattle, kept yeah. cattle around there and stuff like that now, and like, uh, what, a pastoral lease? They wanted to put a pastoral lease and stuff like that now, and he said, no, you can't come and do that. So what they did, they had about four lawyers. They tried to lock you, you can, you can lock me up, but you want to cause a fight? I'll call my people and you'll see what happens. Yeah. You want to see a rampage? Yeah, at that time, back in the 70s, people didn't really understand about law. Not the Gregorian law, because yeah. the, the white man law, never, never, you know, the white man law didn't exist. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you well, they hit you with a boomerang, yeah. and they'll spear you if they had to. Yeah. yeah, you got all different types of spears, different type of boomerangs, and that's how he was. 
he stood up. And guess what they said? Well, which part do you want? That we don't have to, you know, we don't have to go there. We won't have no arguments with him. Yeah. He said, well, this is my country. When you come to my country, you come and talk to me. You don't go talk to the outside no, areas. Yeah. And the first wrong never Yep. And he actually taught a lot of young He actually taught a lot of young Yep. And, uh, and that's all about learning, you know, yes. that learning process. So how did you learn yep. from the Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 But, but at that time, I was sort of a bit too young, and, and then when he passed on, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's still in the Cambridge, and that's why what, what Michael was saying there, I relate with that, and, you know, the thing is, because I was a bit young, and how the law system actually changed, you know, like uh, how the government came in, mm -hmm. and then when they put you to school and stuff like that, now I, I was still at the bush. And then when they, you know, to write things up and say, ah, oh, Read this. I couldn't speak it, so how can you read it? Yeah. And the thing is, like, I relate with Michael. That's all I'll, I'll, I'll say. That, yes. And then, whoever the administrators are, and whatever reason they're making these decisions, yeah, you need to go to whoever they're making the decision for. Because there's someone behind who wants them to make that decision. Right? So you've got to find out who wants that decision to be made. So have a look behind the scenes and see. Why they're making a decision? Why they're asking? No, no, no. When they make a decision on the use of that land, someone's asking them to make that decision. There's an offer on the table. Yes. Yeah. So you need to find out who that offer is being made. Who's making that offer? Yes. That's what you need to find out. And you need to go to them and say, "Here, mate. There's the map. Our mob not giving you authority for that. That's the way. What? What? You want? Can I just add, like, um, <coughs> the Victorian mob here, like the Victorian Traditional Land, land Justice Group who I've been doing voluntary stuff with um, and really pushing the clan-based discussions, that's, that's in mind, it's, that had thinking around this whole sovereignty stuff. So to assert our sovereignty, sovereignty we have to... Um, you know, whilst it's Gunditjmara, there's a whole lot of um, clans that make up Gunditjmara. Yeah. So that's where that booklet, yeah. So that's and that's like that. what this state, Victorian state government, don't want to recognise the clans because they want to group us all together to say we're all Gunditjmara and we're going to all fight over this big parcel. Yeah. Whereas if we break it down and identify with our clans, yeah. then we're even stronger because the clans can you know, piece out that piece of land and say, well, this clan ain't part of what you're doing over there. Yeah. And that's where they're really trying to shut us down with our approach on the clans. They don't want to know about mm -hmm. it. They won't fund our booklet, which, which clearly tells you who the clans are in this state. They want, don't want to know about it. So that's what we need to do in Victoria. Our biggest problem and our biggest threat, the government is using their local land councils. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're called a big split in our communities because they don't, they don't recognise the traditional owners. Yeah. They, they do what you, you said, they, yeah. they, they bring them all at one. Mm. Yeah. They want it all to be one. Yeah. And they don't reckon And the land count is one of the biggest bodies that are yeah. separating us, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And that's what we've got to be. Well, see, with, with that land council, um, I had an experience with the land council in 2002 um, in Geneva, of all places, in the United Nations. I was on a panel on in, um, worldwide development on, on Aboriginal people's land. And the New South Wales Land Council, I was sitting on a panel at the United Nations, and the people there were people from the World Trade Organisation, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and they had the chairman of Rio Tinto, and he was sitting next to me. And I was a black fellow up there representing you know, international development and, um, in Aboriginal land around the world. And I'm sitting there, and, he, and they're all talking about, you know, prior, free prior and informed consent and all this rubbish about, you know, all this. And, you know, we know it. You know, this is all, all talk and rhetoric. But anyway, I, I was sitting there, and I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, I've got an opportunity here to knock out Rio Tinto out of my country. Because Rio Tinto found diamonds in our country. Yeah. And they used the Brewer and the Land Council to get approval to go there and do the mine, do the, do the exploration. And the people on the Brewer and the Land Council had nothing to do with that country, absolutely nothing to do with it. And so I'm sitting next to this bloke and I said, 
he's talking about you know uh, best practice in industry and development, right? And he's saying we got to follow these procedures, free prior and informed consent, and all these wonderful things that they were talking about. And I said, my my response was to a two hundred something audience. I said bullshit. That was, that was my the way I introduced myself. I said this is all bullshit. I said let me give you an example how you abuse the the parliamentary the Westminster parliamentary system of democracy. Yeah? I said in New South Wales they have a land council system set up under the under legislation government. And they divide up into nine regions and there's 336 land councils around. I said, these land councils are not made up of traditional owners. They're made up of anybody in the community. They can get on there. So if you've got the biggest mob in the community and you want to stack that meeting, you can take over a meeting, right? And you get all the power. That's what happens if you want That's right. So, so anyway, I said to this fellow, I'm sitting there and I said, now this is, I said, so Bring on a land council have been given this designated area and it comes into my country, but they are in New Park country, they are on the other side of the river. <coughs> yeah, that's right. So, so that's what they did. So I'm explaining this to them. And I said, now, you're talking about world best practice. I said, you mob come into our country, got approval from the land council because you were required to do it under state law, not under Aboriginal law. And you did the right thing. You did the right thing. You went and got the land council to give you approval. I said, but they, the land council didn't follow procedure and asked my mom. Yeah. And so I said, they went out there, found the diamonds, and they want to develop it. And I said, now, I want you out of my country. I said, it's your country, your country. I said, I want this out of here, because you didn't, my mob don't want it. We don't want you to develop diamonds. Because there's a big story there for that 19 mile plane. I said, there's a big story there. I said, don't touch that. And I said, our people will get sick if you start mucking around. So anyway, he, he looked at me and he said, Rio Tinto, not in New South Wales. I said, I'm sorry, someone's not telling you the truth. So I gave him our lawyer's name and I gave him um, the name of his, his own company, bloke who was coming up there. He said, if that's the case, he said, I will order them out of my country, out of your country, if this is the case. So we come back in after lunch. Fortunately, Office House was still operating in Australia, just closing down. And I knew that lawyer would be in the office until 7 o'clock, so they rang him up. When they rang him up, they said, yes, um, they're trying to force us to sign an agreement. He came back in next after lunch and he said, um, I've just rung Rio Tinto in London, told my office in London, withdraw everything out of your country. He said, I've given the order that no one operates in your country. And so they took all their operations out of our country, out, out of, away from there. They found diamonds, they found sapphires, they found rubies, they found the whole lot. And so we told them that we don't want to do that. Because you see, as soon as money come into the equation, mm. our mob will kill each other. Mm. Our mob will kill each other. <laughs> and that's what I said, keep the money away from my mob. I said, we poor, yeah, we poor, but the thing is that we can still, still live on Johnny Cake and Damper. Yeah. We, we don't. And, and I'd prefer to do that until our people get a bit sensible. You know. Mm -hmm. And so on let me just go back to the sovereignty question now. Um, how do we deal with this? You've got a, you've got a, a, a meeting in an hour. I do. That's right. So well last last this ten isn't minutes. Long we, enough. we need another meeting. Yeah. Give, give me another give me another right now there's a there's hundred and thirty six illuas signed around this country. Hundred and thirty six. Right now none of those illuas are legal. Null and void. They're all null and void. Good. Every one of them. For the federal okay. court. Every one of them. So whatever money the government, the mining companies gave to Blackfellas, all these Illuits that have been signed, they're illegal. Null and void if in that Malaya case. No, only, only if all the applicants didn't sign it. So if one group didn't sign it, that contract, that's only a contract, by the way. Now, Illuits, let me tell you something about Illuits. This year, when John Howard introduced it in 1998, the amendment, Illuus came into existence then, in 1998. They inserted section 24 to 40. It's all about Illuus, okay? Now, this year, they did this for two reasons, okay? And the primary reason is this. See this year, the outer circle, where they planted themselves on top of us? <coughs> Everything happening underneath there 
like I quoted here in their own parliament, they, their, part, their own lawyers said it to the parliament, we are an occupying power. Mm. Now, let me go back to Mabo, and this is what frightened the living daylights out of every white person in this country, and England as well, because they rattled right across there. Here, when this didn't come out, they also said to them, yeah, they also said, the Crown gained radical title, mm. right? So radical title means a title, but they did, and this is the key in, in Mabo, this is the key word, two key words. Not, and then there's another word goes later on. It's called beneficial. Yeah? And then under, in brackets, they got allodium. Now, in short, to short this up, I'm no knowledge of the time, we all know what not is, right? So they got a radical title. Radical. Now here's the funny part about this decision in Marvel. Okay? They said they got a radical title, but not a beneficial radical title. <coughs> so if they didn't get a not if they didn't get a beneficial radical title, well then how can they pass laws to take away our land rights? <laughs> to land. Those laws are illegal. So when John Howard brought this in, he brought it in for one reason. He brought the Ilios in so that all the black fellows, if you look at the fine print down the bottom, it has a section called surrendered area yeah. on every Ilio. Yep. Surrendered area. Yep. You know what that surrendered area is? It means? It means that when you sign this Ilio, you give them legal title over your country right back to when they first started taking our land. In fine print. In fine print. And the white lawyers are not telling you that. <coughs> They're not telling you that at all. Yeah? So, when you challenge this here, say, and say, wait a minute, you can't pass, you can't say that. Now, here's my other problem with this, either one, yeah? If you look here, white man talks about tenure. Tenure okay, is a type of law that governs a part of land, yeah? So they give a white man, here, you got free old, I give you a perpetual pass release, yeah? Land in perpetuity. Now, 99 years. Yeah, 99 years. So, here's the goal. See this? They gave you that right. This thing here, the state government couldn't do that thing. They had no legal right to do it because the High Court said they didn't have that right. So, this EU will come along and get you get all our black to sign it to make it legal for you to have it. And we've given it to you. Yeah. And they can't do it because their parliament can't make that power. Their parliament didn't have that power to make that law. Right? So this EU one is a tricky way for you to give it all up. Mm -hmm. right? And not only that, this EU under that surrendered area, under this Iliwa, the Iliwa there, inside that Iliwa, it says that you give all the future government plans, all the local government plans, you give them the right to make all decisions in the future, and all those decisions in the future are to be classified as past acts. Yes. So you're giving your right away to even negotiate on future development. Which That's is how also the traditional understanding act. That's right. Yes. That's right. Now, yeah. here, let's come back to this E1. Yeah. Tenure. See that there, tenure? The High Court messed it up for Australia. Yeah. Big time. Because the High Court says that Australia holds a tenure of some kind. That's the High Court decision. So the High Court of this country all them nine lawyers sitting up there, or seven lawyers, sit, barrister, um, judges sitting up there, highest court in this country cannot tell you or anybody what type of land tenure they have in this country. So how in the world can any government come along and give you an illua and say to you, this year extinguishes your native title? 
How can they say that? Because the High Court can't even identify what sort of title they have to this land. Madness. Absolute madness. You don't have to be Einstein to know that. You don't have to be a clever lawyer to know that if the High Court said can't identify what type of land tenure there exists in this country, well then how can a state government say to you that title there extinguishes your native title rights? Well, a land tenure is sort of like a lease. A land tenure is a type of ownership, a title, a title, okay? But the Australian High Court said, can't identify what type of land ownership they have in this country. They can't, they, they even say it in the High Court decision. Australia has a land title of a tenure of some kind. So now we say to them, what kind of tenure do you have then? And they went to Barn 4, and on Barn 4, I had a 99 year lease yeah. to, to, to block a land, and a couple of blokes down the road. But the state land, the state land council come along and distinguished all that. Yeah. Did they have power to do that? No. Well, that's what they done. Yeah, they, they do an interview. They do an interview. And then white fellas with them provisional parts and then white fellas with three old guys. <coughs> Us black fellas missed it. But they were panicked and they were telling white people, no black fellas can't claim your yard or back your backyard. Of course they In the cities. That's what, they were that's what all the white people were worried about. Yeah. Because all them white lawyers who represented them white people in them cities were saying, Is our, what do we do? These black fellas can come back to Sydney and take all the land off us. What do we do? And so they're running around telling all these white people, no, 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 they can't do that because you've got a free old title, you see? And so they convinced all the white lawyers in this country under the Bar Association because it's, it's, it's a club, it's a league of men. It's a league of men who swear allegiance to each other to uphold the law that they operate under, yeah? And they have commitments to each other. So. When you get a white lawyer to talk about this, that white lawyer are only thinking about the solid ground that them white fellas have developed. They don't have solid ground, brother. Yeah? You know, there was one thing, if there's one thing I learned from Sunday school when we used to be made to go up from the river to sit up under the tree. Yeah? The only thing I remember that stuck in my head all this time was build on the rock and not upon the sand. <laughs> yeah? White people never build on rock. That's right. Yeah? And us blackfellas don't know how to make that sand move. Yes. If we know how to make that sand move, they own nothing in this country. Yeah? And this is where I'm only one fellow running around who worked all this out. And the, I don't have enough soldiers to run around and do this. So I can only go to communities and go to community meetings like this and say, this is it. Believe it or not. I've got yeah? a big voice, I'm not happy to get on board. But you can, yeah. But the thing is, you see, we got to convince our people, right? And part of the problem, the first time, you know, when you say, well, we got to do this here. The first thing I'm going to say, and I'll wrap it up with this. First thing I'm going to say is, where are we going to get money to do that? That's how, oh, why don't we write to the government? Boom, we just shot ourselves. Yes. Yeah? We put a bomb in our lap and we just let it off. Yeah, that's right. Yeah? And the thing is that because we are all different mobs, this is why what I was explaining to you earlier, why it's very hard to get us to come together. The greatest fear the Australian government has in this country, and them Uncle Tom blackfellas, yeah, all them, mm -hmm. and I hate to say this, but them half caste blackfellas, or been educated in their system, them fellas, they don't have connection to our country. They don't know what it's like to be on a mission. They read books about that and they personalise it at university. Yeah? Now, here's what the government and them blackfellas fear. They don't want the blackfellas from Arnhem Land. They don't want them blackfellas from North Queensland. They don't want them blackfellas from Central Australia and the Western Desert Cultural Block in Western Australia and the Kimberleys. They don't want them joining us with us radicals on the East Coast here. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the moment they do that, the moment we form that, forge that alliance and we form that political power, they're gone. Mm -hmm. They're gone. 
because we got, we know the power of those old fellas. We know the power of them. That, and so we bring them into this fray and start saying, <coughs> you can't make law for a country. We make law for a country. We make decisions for a country. Now, all the people say, we lost a lot <coughs> of our stuff. When I finished ceremony with my old mob in 1978, two years after all of my old fellows were dead, they were in their 90s and late 80s, and the old women. When I finished all that business, they said to me, now, put this back together, you've got to go to this mob over the koala bear mob, you've got to go way down south there to the pelican mob, and I realised it was down here, late tides. I come down and met up with Charlie Carter and his old wife. And then they said, you've got to go over here to the red kangaroo mob, you go up there to the crocodile mob and red belly black snake mob. You gotta go to the crow mob and then you gotta go to Central Australia to that money that went down eagle mob. Yeah? And I found them fellows in our springs. Yeah? And so I had to go to all these places. And I did. I've been to all them places. And so then I had to become part of them. Yeah? And so this is why I can talk now in authoritative language, because I've been there. And I know that business. Yeah? And so what we've got to do now is, I can think like a black fellow better than I can think like a white fellow. Yeah? But at the same time, I can outsmart them white fellows and, read, and outthink them white fellows as well. Because you see, a white man, his problem is greed. He's blinded by greed. Yeah? And if we know what greed truly means, we can undermine greed. Yeah. You cannot serve two masters. Yeah. You cannot serve two masters. And so, as black fellows, we have to share this with each other. Yeah. And so, I've followed this line since 1972. Sovereignty never ceased. The High Court of Australia in Mabo said there's only two, three ways you can get land. It's terra nullius, or you seed it or they beat you in war. If they beat you in war, our laws stay in existence until we negotiate and we trade off what laws and how we combine them laws. That's the rule of engagement in war. That's never been done with us. Yeah? Now, but here, Australia, Mabo cheated us. What they did, was, the way they cheated us, was that they created a law that doesn't exist. And that's called settlement by occupation. Yeah? And the settlement by occupation, the way they expanded that was to say, we were barbarous, uneducated, had no laws of our own, no customs, no traditions, no beliefs. That's why they brought Charles Darwin out here in the 1830s. Yeah? He went down to Kangaroo Island, watched them robbery, went to Bathurst, watched them robbery, and he went home to England and said, oh, they worship animals because they're doing kangaroo and emu dance all the time, and guana dance and all them stuff there. And he said, oh, they, they, pra they practice what they call um, animity, anim animism, okay? where they worship animals. They don't believe in a god. They don't believe in anyone else. Yeah, so, so this is what Charles Darwin said. And, they, and, he, and he did that because then white fellas said, these black fellas got no law, they got no civility, they got nothing, they got no organized society. Marbo knocked that out. Now, my problem with Marbo is they said, oh no, Aborigines have law and culture, have beliefs, and they have usages of their own in terms of land. Now, so how in the world then can Marbo say at the same time that we were barbarous and had no law and custom of our own, so therefore they can have occupation of land of people who don't have no law? Makes no sense. Makes no sense. So they knew the frailty of the decision in the High Court. Then they got their Uncle Toms and they got this Navy title and they didn't expect blackfellas like me to run around and investigate that bloody thing for the last 20 years. And now I've managed to identify and iron all the creases out and I know how they're ripping us off. All we do now is make them come after us when we take it back.